Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Katiana Khalil. I'm an assistant professor of radiology at UCSF, and I'm very excited to be presenting this lecture on breast MRI for you today in collaboration with healthfortheworld.org. Uh, just a quick introduction about myself. Like I said, I'm an assistant professor of radiology at UCSF. I earned my medical degree from Chicago Medical School, followed by a diagnostic radiology residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School, and then completed a women's imaging fellowship at UCSF, where I currently serve as a faculty. Um, I do not have any disclosures or conflict of interest, but I would like to acknowledge my colleagues, Dr. Heather Greenwood and Dr. Bonnie Jo, for their contribution to this presentation. So today we're going to go over breast MRI and the topics that we will be covering would include uh, indications for breast MRI, the MRI report structure per BIRATS uh, criteria. Then we'll go over findings, including abnormal enhancement and uh, how to assess an abnormal finding on MRI. Uh, we'll go over kinetic curve assessment. And finally, we'll talk about giving an overall impression and assessment category and recommendations to your clinicians. So the learning objectives at the end of the lecture, hopefully you would be able to identify indications for breast MRI, become familiar with BIRATS reporting and structure your MRI report, identify abnormal findings on MRI and give final assessment and recommendations. So we'll get started. If you haven't seen an MRI machine before, this is what it would look like. For breast MRI, the patient is going to be facing down with the head here and the breast uh, in a prone position. We use a breast specific coil to get the best signal. And uh, at UCSF, this is the protocol that we use. These are the sequences we will be obtaining for um, breast MRI if it was for cancer assessment. If it was for implant evaluation, then a contrast will not be used. But for screening and um, diagnosing of cancer, these are the sequences we normally obtain. T1 non-fat suppressed but before contrast, T2 fat suppressed before giving contrast, uh, and then again, pre and post contrast T1 fat suppressed images. Um, so we usually get seven phases of uh, T1 fat suppressed images after contrast is given. Uh, we use IV gadolinium for contrast, uh, which is give the usual dose of 0 0.1 millimolar per kilogram, uh, given at 1 to 2 mLs per second and followed by a, around 10 mL of saline flush. So what are the indications for breast MRI? One of the major indications is for screening. Both the American College of Radiology and American Cancer Society recommend screening MRI for high-risk patients. This includes women with greater than 20% lifetime risk of breast cancer, so patients with BRCA mutation, or if they have a first-degree relative with BRCA mutation, even if they're untested, or if the patient had a history of chest radiation between the ages of 10 and 30, or any of these uh, genetic conditions like Lufermani or Cowden, then high-risk high screening MRI is recommended for, for these patients. Uh, the American College of Radiology also recently updated their screening recommendations for intermediate risk patients. These are patients with a lifetime risk of 15 to 20 percent and includes patients with prior personal history of breast cancer and dense breast tissue or if their cancer was diagnosed before the age of 50. For these patients, MRI is recommended. Uh, and if the patient has a history of breast cancer and one of the atypical or high-risk lesions on pathology, such as uh, lobal lobular carcinoma in situ, atypical ductal hyperplasia, or ALH, for these patients, MRI should also be considered, especially if other risk factors are present. Uh, ACR does not recommend screening MRI for patients with average risk or if they're asymptomatic. Uh, it's important to note that the American Cancer Society currently does not have enough evidence to recommend either for or against moderate risk patient screening and uh, does not recommend screening MRI for average risk patients just like ACR. Uh, another important point to note is that breast MRI screening is, is an adjunct to mammography, meaning it does not replace mammography. At UCSF, what we do is alternate MR and mammography every six months. So other than screening, what are the indications for breast MRI? Uh, one thing you can use it for is if 
there's a known cancer, you can use MRI to evaluate the extent of disease, for instance. Is there any uh, invasion of the pectoral muscle? Because that would help the surgeon decide, you, you know, the extent of surgery that needs to be done. So in this case, for instance, you see the mass, but in addition to the, the the mass, it also extends to the pectoralis muscle and you see enhancement of the pectoralis muscle. And this is important to note to the surgeon. Uh, MRI can also help you assess whether the disease is multicentric or multifocal, because again, that's gonna determine management routes that the surgeon is going to take. So in this case, the MRI showed these abnormal enhancing masses in different quadrants of the breast and also extending to the nipple. So again, uh, that is an advantage of MR because it shows you the extent of disease. Another indication is to evaluate treatment response in patients receiving new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, I'll show you an example here. This was a patient that had um, invasive ductal carcinoma, and you see these two large enhancing masses. And this was obtained in 7, 2018. And after a few months uh, of chemotherapy, you can see that the enhancement has basically uh, resolved, meaning uh, the patient was responding to treatment. So MRI would help you assess uh, treatment in the population that's receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Another indication is to evaluate axillary or distant metastasis with unknown primary. Let's say if, there, if a patient presents with axillary lymphadenopathy, either clinically palpated or found on imaging, but there is no um, primary identified on mammography or ultrasound, MRI can be used to problem solve. So this was a patient that presented with, you can see these enlarged abnormal looking lymph nodes in the right axilla. Uh, but the mammography and ultrasound images did not show where the primary tumor was located, and the MR showed this tiny uh, focus of IDC, which was biopsied under MR-guided biopsy, so um, uh, we could know where the primary disease was located. MRI can also be used to screen the contralateral breast in newly diagnosed breast cancer. Here's an example of a patient with known left-sided breast cancer. Here you can see an irregular speculated enhancing mass, really suspicious. There's a biopsy clip in the middle. So this patient had um, known cancer on the left side, but then we obtained the MRI. And then again, you see another abnormal and non-mass enhancement on the contralateral side, uh, which was not detected on ultrasound or mammography. So again, MRI is important for detecting called contralateral disease in about <clears throat> three to five percent of the cases. Um, in the ipsilateral breast, again, you can use MRI to uh, identify occult disease. Uh, this was a, another patient that had, again, suspicious mass that was biopsied and proven to be intraductal carcinoma, uh, invasive ductal carcinoma. And uh, the MRI showed an additional focus, which was not visible on mammography or ultrasound. Uh, MRI can also be used uh, to assess patients with positive margin post lumpectomy. Another indication is to evaluate for recurrence of breast cancer, especially when uh, mammogram and ultrasound are inconclusive, or in patients with, who have had tissue reconstruction, and if it is difficult to differentiate fat necrosis from recurrence, MRI may be useful to uh, problem solve those cases. So this was a patient that had a mastectomy with tram flap reconstruction, uh, presented with a palpable lump. But if, as you can see, she has a lot of fat necrosis and it is difficult to see what's fat necrosis versus if there's anything suspicious underlying. So we obtain an MRI and you see the fat necrosis because it's following fat signal on the uh, T1 non-fat suppressed images here. Uh, but then in addition to the fat necrosis corresponding to this finding, uh, you can also see an enhancing speculated mass, which was suspicious, uh, got biopsied, and it came back as recurrent invasive ductal carcinoma. Uh, here's another example showing recurrence in a tram flap reconstruction on the left breast right here. Um, MRI is also useful in patients with breast augmentation in whom mammography is difficult, especially patients that have free silicone or paraffin injection. Here you can see this patient has had a silicone injection for breast augmentation and the silicone granuloma, these dense white stuff, is obscuring any potential malignancy. 
And it's difficult to interpret this mammography. Uh, but then we obtained an MRI and you can see there, there was no suspicious finding. However, the, the silicone granulomas are not going to be uh, obscuring disease if there was one. So in these cases, MRI is useful. And finally, uh, MRI can be used for MR-guided biopsy if the lesions are of called bone mammography or ultrasound. So here's an example of a finding that's only visible on MRI that we used MRI for uh, MRI-guided biopsy. So we're going to move on to the breast MR report structure. For every report, you want to include a concise clinical history or the indication for the exam. So that would include if there's any symptoms such as breast pain or a palpable lump or nipple discharge. So any of the symptoms should be included. And any prior history of breast cancer or if the patient had prior surgery um, that, or if the patient has a family history of breast cancer, all of those are going to um, help you create a, a holistic report. So all of those indications should be listed. Uh, then the exam would be compared to old studies uh, because it's important to know what's new, what has been stable over the years. So you want to compare all your exams to prior studies. And the acquisition parameters should also be listed. So what sequences were obtained, what kind of uh, contrast agent weight was used, what was the dose, if there was any post-processing done. So those things should also be reported. And then finally, you'll you know, jot down your findings. We'll go over in detail what abnormal findings um, you might be able to see on an MRI. And finally, you wanna give an overall assessment and category with recommendations for your referring clinicians. So the first thing you wanna note is the amount of fibroglandular tissue that um, describes the overall breast composition. And it can be one of these four categories. So this is what an almost entirely fatty breast would look like. There's barely any fibroglandular tissue. Here's a scattered fibroglandular tissue breast. There are scattered areas that have fibroglandular tissue, but the majority of the breast is still fatty. Heterogeneous fibroglandular tissue is, you know, uh, the majority of the breast is fibroglandular tissue and there's um, limited amount of fatty tissue. And extreme fibroglandular tissue breast is almost um, all uh, composed of fibroglandular tissue. Um, and on mammography, this is you know, what we would call extremely dense breast, and that would obscure um, underlying masses. But on MRI, you don't have that problem, meaning even in dense breasts, if, the, if there is an enhancing mass, you're going to be able to see the finding. After noting the amount of fibroglandular tissue, then you want to describe the background parenchymal enhancement or BPE. BPE describes the percentage of enhancing fibroglandular tissue. So in relation to the rest of the surrounding normal breast parenchyma, um, the, how much is the fibroglandular tissue enhancing? Assessment usually occurs on the first post-contrast image, usually obtained around 90 seconds after contrast injection, and the levels can be minimal. Here's the breast showing minimal background enhancement, meaning there's barely any background enhancement. Here's what a mild uh, BPE would look like, moderate, and then marked, uh, basically, uh, there's significant amount of background parenchymal enhancement. Uh, an important point to note is that background enhancement is not the same thing as density. Uh, so you can have a patient with dense breast, meaning extremely uh, fibroglandular tissue, uh, with minimal background enhancement. So those two things are not related. So you can have a dense tissue, but not that much back background parenchymal enhancement. Uh, BPE also varies with hormonal changes. For instance, with uh, hormone replacement therapy, you might see it being more prominent or a less prominent with tamoxifen treatment. And one other important point to mention is, uh, in general, BPE is more prominent in the luteal phase of the cycle, especially if the patient is premenopausal. So the recommended time for imaging a patient for screening is around the second week of the menstrual cycle. Uh, if the patient has a cancer diagnosis and you're obtaining the study for evaluation of extensive disease or to screen the contralateral breast, you can do it at any time. But especially if it's for high-risk screening, you want to optimize 
um, the time of the, the, the time that the study is obtained so that you're not calling background uh, parenchymal enhancement as an abnormal finding. Uh, another thing to note is whether the BP is symmetric or asymmetric. Symmetric BP is benign. Uh, if, it's, if it's asymmetric, it can be benign or malignant. So uh, you should always review the clinical history and look at the mammogram and ultrasound to see if there's any cause for the asymmetry uh, because the positive predictive value for malignancy when you see an asymmetric BPE is around 14%. But there are some benign causes that can cause asymmetric BPE, especially if the patient had prior radiation therapy. Uh, here's an example of a patient with prior radiation therapy for, to the left breast. So there's decreased BPE there, and you can see that the right breast has an asymmetric uh, marked BPE. Or if the patient has mastitis or infection of the breast, uh, you can see an asymmetric BPE. But if the history and the prior images don't indicate, you know, a, plausible cause for asymmetric BPE, you should be suspicious for malignancy as the cause. Next, we'll move on to um, abnormal enhancement. Uh, so what are the abnormal enhancements you might see on an MR study? So abnormal enhancement is described as enhancement, which is greater than the surrounding normal BPE. And this can include a focus, a mass, or a non-mass enhancement, and we'll go through each of these. A focus is an abnormal enhancement that's too small to further characterize, and it's usually less than five millimeters. So it's too small for you to describe the margins or the shape, uh, but it is unique from background parenchymal enhancement, and there's no corresponding finding on the pre-contrast scale. A mass is, in uh, contrast, a 3D space-occupying structure with convex outward contour. It may or may not displace the normal surrounding uh, breast tissue. So here's an example of a mass. It's convex outward contour, you can see here, and it is a 3D space-occupying lesion, and you can describe its shape and margin. So the next thing you want to describe is the shape of the mass. So it could either be round, which is spherical, or, uh, or oval, which is elliptical or egg-shaped. Or if it has a gentle two to three undulations, you can also include that under oval. If it's neither round or oval, then it is going to be described as irregular. And here's an example of what that might look like. Uh, once you describe the shape, then you want to analyze the margin. So it can either be circumscribed, and usually these are uh, considered benign. Uh, there are circumscribed masses that could be malignant, but in general, our suspicion is higher when it is either irregular or speculated. But again, you take a number of things into consideration, so you can't just uh, decide ben benign versus malignant based on um, uh, the margin, but you take all of those factors into account. Um, and after describing the shape and margin, then you want to describe the internal enhancement. So it could either be one of these four findings. Homogeneous, here's an example. There's a contour and uniform enhancement. Uh, heterogeneous internal enhancement describes a non-uniform enhancement. As you can see on the image here, there's an area that's not enhancing that much, and then there's an area that's enhancing um, a bit. So there's a non-uniform enhancement. Rim enhancement, uh, you have more pronounced enhancement at the periphery, and a number of things can cause this. For instance, if there's an inflamed cyst, uh, you would see peripheral enhancement around the cyst, but uh, to confirm that it's a cyst, you can go and look at the bright uh, 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 T2 sequences where the cyst would be bright. Another um, finding that would give you rim enhancement is fat necrosis, which is shown on the example here. But if you go and look at the fat um, uh, non-suppressed T1 images, you can see that the, uh, inside the mass, it is um, following fat signal indicating this is fat necrosis. But uh, malignant etiologies can also cause rim enhancement. This is uh, invasive ductal carcinoma, which was centrally necrotic. So the center part of the mass is not enhancing, but there is a peripheral rim enhancement. And this was biopsied and shown to be um, invasive ductal carcinoma. Uh, another type of internal enhancement is dark internal septations. Uh, you see non-enhancing lines within a mass. This usually indicates a fibroadenoma, but it's not pathognomonic. Uh, 
meaning if you see other features that are suspicious or if the kinetic uh, curve assessment um, shows that the mass is suspicious, it might still need to be biopsied, but usually we see dark internal septations with fibroadenoma. So we've looked at focus and mass, and now we'll move to the third type of abnormal enhancement, which is non-mass enhancement or NME. That is enhancement that's neither a focus nor a mass, but the pa pattern is discrete from normal surrounding parenchyma. So here you see an example of non-mass enhancement. It's not really a mass or a focus. It's, a, it's a, occupying a large part of the breast, um, and that's what we would describe as NME. Uh, so once you identify an NME, you want to describe the distribution. Uh, so it can be focal, which is confined to an area which is less than 25% of a quadrant, as you can see here. Uh, it could be linear, as the name implies, enhancement in a line. It could be segmental or a triangular region of enhancement with the apex pointing towards the nipple. This is usually a suspicious finding because it indicates that this abnormal process is, is following a ductal pattern. <clears throat> uh, another form of distribution is uh, regional, when the enhancement is in a large volume of tissue not conforming to a ductal distribution and tends to be geographic. Or you can see NME in multiple regions of the breast. Or it can be diffuse and affect almost the entire breast. Once you describe the distribution, the next thing you want to analyze is the internal enhancement pattern. Just like we did with masses, it could be homogeneous, which is confluent uniform enhancement, or heterogeneous, non-uniform enhancement in a random pattern. Uh, Clumped internal enhancement describes a cobblestone-like enhancement with occasional confluent areas. As you can see here, there's a more confluent region here, but then it skips and it's like a cobblestone appearance. Or you can have what's called a clustered ring that represents periductal enhancement. And this is a suspicious finding. The positive predictive value for malignancy is about 77%. <clears throat> so next, we want to uh, look at kinetic curve assessment. So there are two portions to the kinetic curve assessment. <clears throat> the initial enhancement phase happens within the first two minutes after contrast injection or until peak enhancement is reached, and it's determined by comparing the intensity in the first post-contrast image to intensity in the pre-contrast image. So if the increase between the pre-contrast and uh, post the first post-contrast image is greater than 100%, we describe that as fast initial phase. If the difference is between 50 and 100%, we describe that as medium increase initial phase. Or if the increase is less than 50%, that's described as slow. And then you want to look at the delayed phase um, enhancement. What's the curve doing after the peak enhancement is reached or after two minutes, what's the curve doing? So if it consistently rises, or if you see 10, greater than 10% increase in enhancement, that's uh, described persistent. If the change is between minus or plus or minus 10%, it's described as plateau. And if it uh, decreases significantly after the peak is reached or if the de decline is greater than 10%, we call that a washout. And usually um, persistent is considered um, benign or not bad. And then uh, plateau and washout are suspicious or bad. But again, that's an overgeneralization. There might be a malignancy with persistent uh, enhancement kinetics. Um, or sometimes, for instance, a lymph node, which is a benign finding, might have a plateau or washout kinetic. So you can't just base it on um, the kinetic curve assessment. Like I said, you take a lot of things into consideration, the morphology, the distribution, and the kinetic curve assessment, and you kind of put those things together to decide whether a finding is suspicious or not suspicious. But just in general, persistent is usually considered um, not as concerning and washout and plateau are concerning. So here's an example of what a type one or persistent curve would look like. So you have the initial peak and then it keeps rising. And on the images, there is the finding, 
it enhances, and then after two minutes, it continues to enhance, so this is a persistent curve. Uh, a plateau curve, there's the initial rise, but then there is no significant uh, change in the enhancement pattern after the first two minutes. Or if you look at the images, there's a finding, it enhances, continues to enhance, but after the two minutes, there's no significant change in the plateaus. For washout, there's the initial rise, but then after the two minutes is reached, there is a decline in um, degree of intensity of enhancement. So you see this finding, it enhances initially, but then after two minutes, the contrast completely washes out. So this is a suspicious finding. So once you have um, described your abnormal enhancement findings on the MRI, then you wanna look for associated features. So these are features either standing on their own or in, uh, in addition to other findings that you've seen, uh, raise your suspicion uh, for cancer, uh, or they might be related to prior surgery, but you just wanna look for them and describe them. So I'll show you a few examples. Here's a uh, speculated enhancing ugly looking mask but you can see that it's tethering on the nipple and there's nipple and skin retraction. So you want to look for that and then report it when you see it. Same thing here. There's an abnormal enhancing speculated mass and it's tugging on the nipple. So there's nipple and skin retraction. Uh, nipple and skin invasion. It's important to note this because it might preclude the patient from uh, getting a skin sparing mastectomy. So if you see the skin, uh, or the nipple enhancing or being invaded by the disease. It's important to mention that uh, on your reports. Skin thickening and a skin invasion again. Skin thickening can be due to skin invasion or it can be due to other um, benign ideologies. For instance, prior uh, radiation therapy can cause uh, skin thickening uh, or mastitis. Axillary adenopathy, here's an example of abnormal lymph node. So you want to mention that in addition to the, you know, this patient had inflammatory breast cancer, but uh, which has metastasized to the right axillary lymph nodes. And you want to also mention if there's, like I mentioned at the beginning, if there's any pectoralis muscle or chest wall invasion, because that would change the management um, options that the patient might have. So you want to look for that and report that. Um, so you can also have non-enhancing findings that are not enhancing on the post-contrast images. Uh, one of these is a ductal pre-contrast high signal on T1, meaning on the post-contrast images, there's no enhancement, but on the pre-contrast images, you'll see this T1 high signal, and this is usually to protonaceous content within the ducts or blood within the ducts. But when you look at the subtraction images where you subtract the pre-contrast image from the post-contrast image, you see that, that there's no intrinsic enhancement and the bright signal was just from the protonaceous or bloody content within the ducts. Here's another example. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the T1 images showed a bright um, ducts. So when you do the subtraction, there's no real enhancement. Uh, cysts are other uh, findings which are non-enhancing usually and they are circumscribed, fluid-filled, and you might occasionally have uh, peripheral enhancement, especially if the cyst is inflamed, uh, but the center should not be enhancing, and the walls should be thin and imperceptible. So this is a benign finding. Uh, you can have hematoma or seroma in a patient that has had surgery or a biopsy, and this could be simple or complicated and maybe bright on the T1 um, images due to blood, but should not enhance on the post-contrast images. So here's an example where you see a T1 bright circumscribed mass, and then on the post, it appears that it's enhancing, but when you do the subtraction, there's no real enhancement, and this brightness was due to the intrinsic T1 bright signal due to hematoma. So this was post-operative seroma containing some hematoma. Uh, and you can have skin thickening, again, unrelated to malignancy, especially if the patient had uh, prior ex, uh, radiation treatment, you can see this right breast has asymmetrically thickened skin. You can also have fat-containing lesions. Uh, lymph nodes are fat-containing lesions, and you can see the fatty hilum on the T1 images. Uh, lymph nodes can be normal or abnormal, so you would uh, base that on the morphology and the size. Uh, fat necrosis is another fat-containing lesion. We saw an example earlier with the rim-enhancing lesions centrally following the fat signal on all sequences. 
hamartoma uh, can have uh, can contain fats, so that could present as a fat-containing lesion, or post-operative seroma with fat can contain um, fat. So now we move on to impression. We've described all the findings that you might be able to see on an MRI. Impression is your overall summary um, that you would give to the clinician. So you want to give an assessment category based on virats, and we'll go over that. In addition, if there's any imaging recommended, uh, you want to provide suggestions for the next course of action. So you want to guide your clinicians what to do next after you give the assessment. Um, for a BIRAD score or a suspicious lesion, if there is no, um, so you want to recommend a second look ultrasound instead of going directly to MRI guided biopsy because ultrasound guided biopsy is more comfortable for the patient. It's less expensive. It's readily available. So if the mass is large enough to be seen on an ultrasound, you want to recommend ultrasound guided biopsy. But if there is no sonographic correlate, then you can move on to MR guided biopsy of the finding. Uh, BIRAD's uh, assessment categories are based on BIRAD's lexicon uh, for mammography, uh, or it's similar to BIRAD's uh, categories for mammography. Uh, category zero uh, implies that additional imaging evaluation is needed before you can make any recommendations. Uh, at UCSF, we almost never use this unless there was some technical uh, difficulty that um, prompted the study to be repeated, but otherwise we usually make our determination based on uh, the images that we have. Um, category one describes a negative exam. So you, there was no finding to be reported and it, the exam is negative for cancer. Category two implies that there were some benign findings that you chose to describe, such as cysts, non-enhancing scars, or if the patient had a breast implant, but both for category one and category two, the conclusion is that there's no MR evidence of malignancy. Category three is probably benign. Uh, there's a less than 2% chance or likelihood of malignancy. Uh, we use that in mammography and ultrasound as well. But for MRI, there's limited data currently to guide us which findings should be categorized under uh, probably benign category. So at this point in time, we don't use category three at UCSF, other institutions do. But once more da data becomes available, I'm sure we'll you know, uh, categorize some findings under this category. Category four is suspicious finding. There's a low to moderate probability of uh, being malignant. So there's a greater than 2%, but less than 95% likelihood of malignancy. Uh, and for, for this, the recommendation is tissue sampling. So you want to biopsy. Uh, if there's a sonographic correlate, you want to biopsy it under ultrasound. And if not, you want to biopsy the finding under MRI guidance. Category five is highly suggestive of malignancy. So this is almost certainly malignant. There's a greater than 95% likelihood of malignancy. Um, and for this, if the pathology result comes back as benign, you would not accept it and you would either recommend repeat biopsy or surgical excision. Category six is used for known biopsy proven malignancy. Uh, if a suspicious lesion is found uh, in a patient that has known malignancy, that should be worked up. So you want to categorize that as category four or five as appropriate and not six. The six is used for biopsy proven malignancy and the patient is already uh, on treatment plan. But if you see an additional finding in addition to the known cancer, you want to categorize that as four or five and have the appropriate biopsy performed before uh, proceeding with um, treatment the treatment for the known bio cancer. So uh, the take home messages uh, are MRIs and adjunct to mammography. So it's a very robust tool, but it does not replace mammography. And it's not always available in all parts of the world. So uh, while it's really important to know um, how to read an MRI or we should recommend MRI to our, the appropriate um, population of patients when available, but you should remember that it's an adjunct to mammography and it does not replace mammography. MRI interpretation follows a systematic approach. So we looked at how you 
uh, evaluate step by step, um, put all of your findings together to come to a conclusion. So you want to look at how much fibroglandular tissue there is, what the background parenchymal enhancement level is, whether it's symmetric or not. And then you want to look for your abnormal enhancement uh, or abnormal enhancing findings. Uh, describe the shape, morphology, distribution. Um, look into the history to see if there's anything that explains any of the associated features like skin thickening or asymmetric enhancement of the breasts. And then finally, you want to assess uh, the kinetic curve, the, how the curve uh, behaves, and come up with an overall impression. Uh, another important point that I want to uh, emphasize is that morphology trumps kinetic curve assessment, meaning if the mass has suspicious morphologic features, even if the kinetic curve assessment is reassuring, you should still categorize that finding as suspicious because uh, you should go with the most suspicious feature, even if the kinetic curve assessment is persistent or uh, benign appearing, uh, you should go with the most suspicious feature. Finally, once you take everything into account, you wanna give a final assessment category and recommendation for each breast. So just as a review, BIRAT zero or category zero is when you need additional imaging. Usually we don't use that for MRI, but for some reason, if there was technical difficulty you, know, you want to recommend uh, the patient to come back to get the additional images. Uh, category one is for negative exams. There was nothing that you needed to mention. Category two is benign. Uh, so like a cyst, implant, something you mentioned, but there's no evidence of breast cancer is the conclusion. Category three is for probably benign findings that have a less than 2% likelihood of being malignant. Uh, we usually don't use that on MR, but in the future, once enough data is available, we're all gonna be using that. Category four is for suspicious findings uh, that prompt a biopsy recommendation. Category five is highly suggestive of malignancy and if a benign finding returns, you will not accept that. Category six is for patients with known malignancy, but if they have an additional site of a suspicious finding, that should be categorized as four or five. That is all I have for you today. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions and would like to reach out, here's my email address.